I'm Chris, and I hope you can see my slides. If not, the video is going to be available later on as well. Uh, I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft. I work on the Edge team and especially on the developer tools inside the Edge browser. If you haven't used that one yet, please do. It's a great browser. It's available on all platforms. On all platforms where VS Code is available as well. And today, I want to talk to you a bit about how to make it easier to debug web applications with Visual Studio Code. Specifically, I want to talk about something called context switching. And uh, this may not be a thing that you are aware of, and you may not see it as a problem, but I find it as something that is most grating as a developer. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in, as a web developer, we work in three contexts. We write code in an editor. We then go to the browser and tweak it and change it and see if our CSS really did the things they were supposed to do. And once we're happy with that, we go to the terminal, and there we do your, your version controlling, your building, your bundling, and your basically your deployment are the things that you do from that. Um, you might already see the problem here. We're actually using three tools, and we need to be experts in all these tools, or at least we need to know a bit about each of them. That's a cognitive overhead that I think makes us less effective as developers. And as web developers, we're used to this. I've been a web developer for 25 years, and I never had one thing that did it all. And if it was one thing, it did horrible things to the web. But people coming from other platforms are expecting one IDE to do that one thing. And as Eric explained this morning, VS Code was never meant to do that. And other IDEs that, to me, are far too heavy to do that kind of stuff. But it seems like when I come from another platform to the web, because of that change into different tools all the time and having to think about that, it seems like the web tooling space is less effective than the other places. And that's sad because the web is actually quite great and I'm very happy to be part of it. So we tried uh, now to get rid of all these context switching that you have to jump from one tool to the other just to do a task. And the first attempt was actually in the developer tools themselves. Like you do your testing in the developer tools, but we also thought like, what about going back to the coding editor all the time? So um, if you look at them, what we have right now in the developer tools, there's a full-fledged editor in there. You can not only tweak some CSS things, but if you click on, an, on a file name of a CSS file, you get into an editor. This is not based on Monaco. This is still an older version of, uh, uh, of CodeMirror. So it's actually not on par with what VS Code does. But back then when that was a thing, uh, it was quite amazing that you actually just need a browser to, to start developing. And when I did trainings where I couldn't install things on people's machines, this was a great way to get them started. But when you look at the uh, functionality of it, you've got an editor in there and you've got a full breakpoint debugging environment, a JavaScript breakpoint debugging environment, all the things that you need right in the browser. Now, when we look at the usage stats of that, however, I think the proper term would be to say it's suboptimal. Because uh, we kind of know that you can always replace one great breakpoint with like 12 random console logs throughout your code base, and that does the same thing. So we don't see much uptake on that editor change. But at the same time, we see a huge uptake on the visual tools that we're doing. So this is debugging the CSS. This is actually on finding out what something is. On the top, you see here the new overlay. If you overlay or something after inspecting it, you see the HTML name of it, the colors, the measurements, and also accessibility information. You get things like if it's keyboard accessible and what role and what uh, what structure it has. We also added more things like a color picker that gives you like a color selection from what is in the CSS. And we now started doing font editor in there as well, and CSS grids debugging and CSS flexbox debugging, because uh, CSS has become quite heavy. So we realized that the big win of the developer tools are these visual tools that allow you to fix your code much better. On the editor side, Visual Studio Code is one of my biggest happiness moments when it came out. I just joined Microsoft when Visual Studio Code came out, and I came from Mozilla, so I was all this open source guy, and I'm like, this is incredible. Uh, and what the context switching in VS Code win to me is that it has this integrated terminal and the Git integration and also linting options. If you haven't used it yet, there's an extension called WebHint that's also partly done by my team, which allows you to find a lot of mistakes that you're doing in your code before you actually write them. So it actually puts squiggly lines under something when something is wrong, much like CSS linting or, J or JavaScript linting does for you as well. But what I love most about this one is that the deployment and the coding becomes in one editor. I don't have to jump to the terminal and I have to do things there. I can keep it inside VS Code directly without being as heavy as other IDEs like Xcode or Visual Studio is. 
So this was another one where we got one rid of one context more to make sure you don't actually need to jump and need to know everything around there. And it may not be a big thing for us, but explaining Git to people and the command line to people is quite a barrier for people that start web development. And I love that with the integration of Git inside VS Code, we can concentrate on doing proper commenting rather than just doing the learning about all the shortcuts and all the Git commands. So the other thing that changed a lot lately is that uh, Visual Studio Code, for example, is completely hackable. It's completely open. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript inside uh, inside Electron. And browsers themselves are not these black holes that they used to be as well. We had no idea what browsers were when I started as a web developer and what could, what they could do. We also had no insights what's coming next as functionality. And all of that is now open. But more importantly, you can actually automate browsers in the background. You can let them run silently in the background. You can send requests to them. And you can get, for example, the website that you wanted to see as an image back. That's great for continuous integration, for testing. And using WebDriver, you can, you can automatically control everything that's going on in the browsers. All of our testing in the developer tools is done that way. So we don't click them bit by bit. We actually have a script that runs through them. And that started with Selenium, and now we've got Playwright and all the other things to automate that. And also based on the web driver component here. We also can embed browsers nowadays better, like the with a web view and now the web view too. These are evergreen browsers inside other applications. In the past, it was always an outdated browser somewhere else or a web view that was only limited. But now you can do the whole thing that the browser does inside other environments and other applications. And that's really useful. And what, one of my main things that I liked about Visual Studio Code is that it's extensible. The extension API is actually pretty uh, um, OK to use. It's easy to understand. I don't want to say easy, because easy might be different for different people. But I found it at least properly documented. And that's something I didn't expect from a lot of other tools, or I, I had bad experiences in the past. And many things that made a Visual Studio Code a success for other people was the extensions that came with it. So we thought about. Why don't we merge the two together? Why don't we take the uh, efforts to cut down on context switching of Visual Studio Code and on Edge and see what we can do together? And that's exactly what we did. And we created an extension called Microsoft Edge Tools for VS Code. I know that's a mouthful, but we need to do that because of licensing reasons and all kind of stuff, much like when Eric talked earlier about Monaco and that we had to put the quotes around it. Uh, it's an extension that's been around for a year now. It actually has quite some good download numbers. But I want more. And I want you to actually tell us what we could do better to make this even more useful for you. And that's why I do this session and also be available later on for questions and answers for everybody around there. Uh, but what, it's, what does it do, actually? This is what it looks like. Uh, well, one of the things it does is you can, you can connect to an instance of a browser. And it will open the browser with the developer tools directly open in the editor. And you can use those cool visual tools to tweak things and to fix things around. But this time, when you click on the CSS link, for example, you edit it directly in Visual Studio Code, meaning you have a browser inside the Visual Studio Code environment without jumping to the browser and back. You don't need to integrate it like that. You can also have it in an external window. But there is an issue with it, which I'm going to come back to in a second. The point now is that actually we brought the tooling, the visual tooling that people use from the browser inside VS Code. And we have the power of the VS Code editor next to that one rather than having an editor that's quite outdated and not as useful as our usage numbers shows. So what you can do right now is actually you can inspect, edit, and tweak the DOM structure of the product you build using the tools that you used to from the browser. You can inspect network requests. So we put the network tab in there as well. You can interact with the browser inside VS Code. So this is not a, a, a stream or a cast or a video. This is actually a full browser. You can click in it. You can, you can enter uh, content in it. You can test it like any other browser window as well. And you can sync changes with your code. So if you set up source maps and watchers, it's basically a two-way direction. Uh, which, uh, changing it in the styling tools, changing in the code will reflect in both of them. You can choose a different version of Edge that you want to run. So it could be the stable version, which probably is what your end users are using. But you can also use the developer edition or the Canary, which is a daily build. And you can choose an own browser window. If you have, for example, a second screen, that's a great way to do. Or you can choose to get it embedded inside the tool itself, which is something that I prefer for obvious reasons, which I'm going to come to in a second. It wouldn't be VS Code Day if we wouldn't open the, the, the hood a bit and uh, tell you what's going on and show you a bit about the warts and problems that we encountered. 
And the first thing that we realized, we as, as Microsoft, we have to make everything accessible to people with screen readers and keyboard. Like that's a that's a out of the box. We can't get into a full stable release without doing that. And making a complex interface like the developer tools and HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and still keeping them accessible to screen readers and other assistive technology was quite a task. It became even more of a task as soon as we embedded it inside an iframe, inside an extension, inside VS Code, which is also written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But we learned a lot of tricks, and the VS Code team is very helpful there that we actually made it happen as well. There are quite some differences in keyboard handling between Mac and PC. For example, I'm a Mac user, and I realized I couldn't copy and paste into the URL field of that browser if it was embedded. So we needed to fix that one. So there's a few fixes in the source code of the extension as well. And macOS doesn't like browser windows running in the background. Like when you have a window, then you say, like, I can make an external window, and the window is not visible. For some reason, it actually re reported itself as non-active in the extension which was really frustrating. You, uh, and the fun thing was you had to move your window a bit smaller and the browser window and just show a few pixels of the browser window and then it was still active. So that was a bug we couldn't fix. So we actually uh, in, uh, tried to set we got the headless version where you can embed it and that made it much easier. If it's on a different screen, then it's, then it's okay. If it's on one screen, then we had an issue with that. The other issue is that Electron lags behind Chromium a bit. Like it's it's an older version of Chromium that runs inside Electron. So not all the functionality, the bleeding edge functionality that we have in the canary build of the developer tools is available in the extension. So that's something to also consider if you really want to do something with a hardcore Chromium extension like we do. So the feature history is interesting. Like we, we we looked at the features, what we should build by asking you. We wanted to get feedback. And we also looked at the telemetry of the browser, like what people used in the browser developer tools were most likely the things that you want to see in that extension as well. So the element tool was the first one. Everybody uses that one, like the visual editors in there. The network tool was next because network inspection is an interesting one as well. And then we re-architected the whole thing. We realized that contribution to the extension is kind of tough when you have to build the whole of Chromium just to change a typo. So we changed the architecture and made you only load the things that you need from the Chromium core to actually contribute to it. And that made it much easier for third-party developers to also help us with building that thing. We allowed for any version of Edge. We previously, it was only the Canary version. And again, that doesn't have as many users and probably gives you false positives of what's possible in your final product. And we added Edge driver as a dependency. Before that, you had to install the driver. <laughs> Sorry. And now it's bundled with the extension, so you don't need to install two things. It's automatically putting the thing in that it needs to do. You don't have to worry about that anymore. The headless mode was next to fix the issue with macOS. And then we also thought about themes. There's dark and light theme right now. We're trying to match the themes from VS Code, but it's actually tough to do. So something that we're working on, but we will see if we can get it done. So what's next? Um, I, I wish you tell us, like, we really want to do things that you use later on. We want to put things in there that people want, not what we think might be a good idea. So the whole thing is on GitHub. It's, that's where we do our interaction with our end users as well. And what the telemetry says of the browser also, it tells us what we want to build next. Now I'm saying that I only want to do things that you tell me, but I'm going to tell you one thing right now that we're doing, and I want to have some feedback and see what you think. One idea that we're having right now is that inspecting the network is a great thing, but it's not quite enough when, you, when it comes to development. Often we have like a 404 or we have some API that doesn't give it the right data back and we want to know how to inspect that. What was the problem that caused it that the information didn't come back? And that's why we have a new extension, a new experiment in the developer tools that you can use in the browser right now called Network Console. That one allows you to edit and resend any request and when you use that one, you get an interface, much like any third-party tool, again, one context that you need to go to and back, that allows you to tweak all the different settings of the request, change the request parameters, and also find out if the right data comes back. So if you think that's a good idea to put into that extension, if that's something that's missing, that's what we're working on next. Or if you say no, then we're probably working on something different. So if you want to get in contact with us, uh, context, <laughs> if you want to get in contact with us, uh, this is the Edge Dev Tools on Twitter. This is me in the middle bringing coffee for everybody. Uh, then there's Zohair, Rachel, and Erica. They're all working on the same team. You can download the extension at AKAMS Dev Tools for Code with dashes in between. And you can visit us on GitHub. And please come and play with us. And that's all I had to present for today. Thank you very much.
Excellent and well done, Chris. Uh, it sounds like you had context switching on the mind when you were saying contact there, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a thing. It's, it's like when thing. you write these slides, you keep using it. It's a normal, it's very common that you actually do that. Gotcha, gotcha. So I noticed, I know you mentioned in the presentation that there were some things that you learned from this, but I imagine there was probably a lot and it was hard to fit all that onto one slide. So what, one question I have for you is what was the biggest or one of the biggest hurdles you all faced when building out the extension? I think the the uh, that we're embedded in another environment is something that was problematic because we're already inside the browser and we we uh, we find out that we that we can do a few things there, but making the keyboard access, for example, switching by tabbing, going from one thing to another, getting from VS Code into the extension and back was something that we found kind of tricky. Um, other than that, the other problem was the, the difference of the versions of Chromium that we that we always lag a bit behind, so we cannot use some of the new functionality. But in general, the the benefit is that in the VS Code environment, we have much more power than we will have in the ever ever have in the browser. Because in the browser, we're for example beholden to the uh, sandbox of security, whereas in VS Code, I would uh, and that's what I'm thinking about next. How can we actually integrate much much more into your workflow of VS Code rather than just clicking the link and going into the editor? How can we take the higher fidelity of a code editor and do something with that in that extension? Because um, it's it's a new place to play, and especially the network to the network console. If we put it in there, that's going to have much more power in VS Code than it has in the browser. Because we, for example, we don't have the problem with setting cookies and reading cookies, which we can't do in a browser. Um, outside of that, so we would be in the same context as VS Code. So I'm excited about putting more functionality into that one. I also want to give a shout out to the uh, to the engineers that we have on there. It's two people on there. It's like Michael and and Vidal, and they're incredible. It's just it's it's so amazing what you can do with a few engineers. And as somebody who knows code as well as a PM, it's it's wonderful to see how an open product like VS Code can be extended by us without actually having to ask anybody. We just look at the source code and go for it. And that's wonderful. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to see the future of the extension and what you all come up with. And uh, thanks again, Chris. You're welcome.